My father was an only child. His mother had had multiple, I don't know what, stillbirths, miscarriages, bad luck in having other children. And so she only had this one child, my father. One of the most amazing things that I could never get over is that she was afraid that the Malach HaMovis, the angel of death, would see him and take him away from her because she had lost these other children. And so in order to trick the Malach HaMovis, she didn't talk to him for the first year of his life. I mean, she must have talked to him, like some little instructions or something, but she tried not to speak to him um, to see if that would somehow bring some luck. It's an extraordinary thing. Every time I think about it, that he developed into a sort of reasonably normal person is just incredibly powerful thing to me. My, my great-grandfather was the Yiddish writer Sholem Ash, and uh, I didn't know him. He died two years before I was born. Um, but I grew up um, knowing my, his daughter, my, who was my grandmother, uh, obviously extremely well, and we would go around there for regular uh, weekend family lunches. And she, her flat in London was, in, in a way, a sort of like these house museums of great writers, you know, you have in Russia and around the world. And, and she, her place was full of his books, his paintings, his, the remnants of his Judaica collection, his photographs. Um, and so somehow we absorbed as children this, this atmosphere. He was a hugely dramatic personality. There are all sorts of just stray anecdotes. There, there was a piece I came across um, written by a guy who had been an, a bank clerk in a Warsaw bank when Ash had come in to withdraw, cash a check or withdraw some money or something. And, and he remembered and wrote this piece 40 years later about how Ash was pacing up and down and the manager was busy so he couldn't see him so there was more time to wait. So he stripped off, took his jacket off and started doing press-ups on the floor because you know, at a certain time he was very into the idea of physical culture and doing his exercises. And then someone else came to him and he started arm wrestling with him. You know, it wasn't enough for him to do his press-ups. He wanted to show how strong he was and he challenged some random stranger to an arm wrestling match. You know? And this guy was observing this and wrote a very funny piece about it many, many years later. And, and you know, there, there, there are a lot of stories like that that are just sort of gems in their way, just hidden in the, in the, in the newspapers that are turning brittle and turning to, to dust in the archives. Speaking of your family history, mm -hmm. maybe we should talk a little more about that, and starting with your, your great-grandfather on your father's side, Moisha Yep, Moisha Katz. Katz. He was born in um, Belarus, but they moved to Nikolaev in a, um, the Ukraine um, when he was three. In 1903, there was a huge pogrom um, in Kishinev, and like the Jewish world was rocked by it. And one of the things that happens is a lot of um, self defense movements start popping up. And he and a friend of his decided um, they'd heard rumblings that there would be a pogrom in Nikolaev. And so he and his friend started a self defense group. My grandfather and my great aunt are both born in the United States, and then in the early 30s, no, 20s. Um, in the 20s, they go back to Russia, I mean, to build the state of, um, well, actually, to build a state of Israel, not Israel. But um, my great-grandfather was part of expeditions to find the Jewish homeland within the USSR, that they are going to be, um, I mean, what becomes, um, Ah, Birbijan, um, that they're going to build a Jewish homeland um, that is communist. And apparently he was in some exhibition that was uh, checking out Siberia. Um, but in the early 30s, 
there is another break within the Communist Party, and the, um, the Freiheit, which my great-grandfather was very, very involved in, which was the communist magazine in um, New York, newspaper in New York, the treasurer left with some money, or there was something the Freiheit was in trouble, and my great-grandfather was sent back to the States. Now, he thought this was just going to be a year tops. It turns into two, and my great-great-grandmother uh, Esther says, I'd like to be near my husband. So he, she and my grandfather come back to the States. My great-aunt is still in um, Russia because she was in university. I'm not sure she might have been married um, already, that she had a life and she wasn't going to be leaving it because the family was going to be coming back within a few years anyway. And the Iron Curtain fell. And um, my great-grandfather keeps trying to get back to Russia. I mean, through the war, through everything, is trying to go back, trying to go back, that that's where he wants to be. And um, members in the State Department and, like, you know, people who knew him and knew what was happening in Russia, that was not public. Um, but they had some idea of what was happening, and they wouldn't let him. Um, they would block him at every turn, every time he tried to go back. And um, apparently, when Stalin's crimes in the big Khrushchev speech, um, when Stalin's crimes become public, that's when he— um, we don't know if he withdrew from the Communist Party or if he just withdrew and stayed a member, but was no longer active in the party. Um, that I mean, hearing that all his friends were murdered um, by Stalin. And in the 60s and 61, I think, he went back to um, Russia, um, finally, and saw his daughter and had dinner with the friends of um, the murdered writers and culture makers, and died that night. That um, Because he was an American citizen who died in Russia, they did an autopsy, and they said that his arteries were so clogged they couldn't believe that he had been living for six months. Um, and, I mean, yeah, it was just this thing that he had to do, and then he died. Meine Tante Mama haben Gewehre, beste Gewehre, wo sehr Kinder sind aufgewachsen mit mir und mit meinem Bruder. Und sehr jüngster Sohn ist mehr oder weniger, mein älterer ist 18, hat das schon jünger vor mir. Wir sind ein Kima, demselben Alter, und wir sind Tage aufgewachsen in einem. Und er, der Haber hat Hassan gehabt mit a Kala von Bosnia und nicht der politisch zugepasste Zad von Bosnia. Es heißt es, als wenn man hat Hassan mit a Serb von Bosnia, man kommen nicht zusammen sehr oft, weil es ist noch als a Schwierigkeit zu fahren von Serbien in Amerika. Technisch gerät sind wir noch als Sonnen is die Machotanum haben gewollt vor in Louisiana zu praven Silvesternacht. Um, und mein Tates Haver hat mamisch gewollt praven Silvesternacht in, de, in dem geherrigen Louisiana Steger. Was heißt? Cochon de lait. Besser gerät Cochon de lait, aber in Louisiana ist das Französische ein bisschen war kripple geworden, Kuschon de Leid. Ist was Tietman, mir gefällt ein Chasel und mir schacht es und mir kocht es in der Erde, Mamisch. Hat der Chaver gesagt, ich will machen ein Kuschon de Leid, aber wo gefällt mir das Chasel? Wer kann gefällt ein Chasel? Hat er gedacht im Moment. Und er hat gesagt, David Kaplan. Mein Tate, was heißt noch Sansei, der David Kaplan. David Kaplan kann gefällt ein Chasel. Klingt er an, mein Tate, fragt er, Wir wollen machen eine Kuschel und Lei, wir dürfen eine Kasera. Was kannst du tun für mir? Sagt mein Tate, gib mir, gib mir ein paar Minuten. Ein halbes Jahr später, mein Tate, weil er ist mein Tate, hat gesagt, ich habe gefunden das Kasera. 
is in Jena Yor is Sylvester Nachgeven am Oitzi Shabbos. On Ech met man Freud, the Hom Nofnishka Hatin Kinder, Zenigeven in Louisiana. Is Manatata Mama Hom Asach Gedold, Nish Farmir nor Farmine Freud. Hom Zay Gekoif Bazunder Akalem, Hom Zay Golost Kashrin den Kirch, nor Far das Bissolzeit was mir Kim and Zagas. Is Miram Gehalten, is given Freitag noch in the Tag Miram Gehalten in Zu Great Nach Shabbos, while Dos is Unser Steger, Nish Manat Hatta Mamas Steger. Is Mein Tate kommt a heim von der Arbeit, sorgt er zu Mein Freud, zu sein Schnorr, treff nur, was gefind sich im Bagage nick. Sorgt Mein Freud, sehr tame Warte dick, ach weiß nicht, da paar Häusen, Tate handelt in Kleider. Sorgt Mein Tate, Tierkick. Is er erfend in Bagajnik Ottozoi, a geschochtene Chazero. Okay, is der, der Tag der Nacht is given by Sishab, is given Sil Silvester Nacht. Mir gehen alle auf der Simche. Mein Freund und ich, mir essen in Farois. Aber, wir kommt zu dem Kuschon de Lay, und there is da die ganze jüdische Bevölkerung von der Stadt Louisiana, von der Stadt Alexandria. Der Rabbiner, er ist nicht kein Chazerfleisch, aber er ist da. Und das einzige, die einzige Mischbache von Bosnia. Und das ist, was es meint, aufzuwachsen wie ein Jid in Alexandria, Louisiana. Man tut genau, was die nicht jeden tun. Man tut dieselben Sachen, was die nicht jeden tun. Uh, aber man tut es mit anderen Jeden. Und es soll mir aufgewachsen. My great grandfather. His name is Eddie, and that's the grandpa I'm named after. My middle name is Edward. Um, so Eddie lived in Ukraine with his family, and I really need my grandmother to tell the story right, but they were working at a textile shop, and then the Bolsheviks came in and said that they didn't own the shop anymore. And so they decided to immigrate to America, and um, it's a long story of how it happened, but eventually the family got to America, but Eddie was left behind because he he had some sort of small sickness like uh, chicken pox or something held him off the boat. So he had to go to America by himself. And he lived with his grandmother for a while in Kiev. And he hated it. He couldn't stand living with her. And so he went to the train station. He didn't have a ticket. He went to the train station, got on the train, and as the conductor was coming uh, to collect tickets, he was freaking out. This woman on the train saw him, and this woman had a huge dress on. So she went like this, come here, come here, and hid my great-grandfather under her dress so that the uh, conductor wouldn't catch him. And then eventually he made it to the boat, and his family picked him up when he got to America. So then there's a story, just a funny story, of a biker bris. I'm called to do a bris in Spofford, New Hampshire, southern New Hampshire. Um, and the dad's Jewish and the mom isn't. And, you know, I don't get much of a sense of who these folks are over the phone. But yes, they'll do a mikvah, and they're committed to raising their kid Jewishly. And this is his second marriage and her first. And she's younger than he is. And so I get drive up about a mile down a dirt road, but it's still not way off in the woods. And I drive up to this house, and there are 15 huge motorcycles with the big hogs, the big, you know, choppers in this yard. And I walk in and there's this six foot four father with gray hair down to his shoulders and about a 24 year old mom. Just everybody beaming, everybody happy, nice to meet you, this great big hand, like twice the size of my hand. And I walk into the bathroom to wash my hands and there are piles of biker magazine and all of this stuff. And we go up to the kitchen, and it's all this family's biker friends. It's his mom and his brother, but all these biker friends, all these like old hippies with biker jackets and stuff hanging out. And I'm trying to get us all to focus on, on all of this. And I usually, you know, change stuff to fit the crowd. So somehow, 
somehow we're all pretty connected with all of this, I think. And at the end of the bris and everybody's saying mazel tov and eat something or whatever, this 6'5 this guy comes up to me and pats me on the back and says, that was really cool, man. But you know what? That wasn't at all like Seinfeld. <laughs> I, I said, no, I'm glad it wasn't at all like Seinfeld. We just had a good laugh about it. Um, I said, was it okay? Said, yeah, it was really good. Um, all of these things happen. It's, a, it's sort of just this very powerful moment in people's lives. And sometimes it brings me to such grateful feelings of, of, being, of, of being a part of it just being asked to be in people's lives at this very intense moment and how somehow you can capture all of this. Near uh, Nathan's, there was a place called the Schwitz. Do you know what a Schwitz is? A Schwitz is a place that you go to where you want to sweat it out. You go in for a massage, and it's like a sauna is today with a massage. Well, those were schwitzes in those days. And we used to go there, and we used to stay there overnight. We, we used to go in, I forget what it costs now, and we used to take all our clothes off, and they, we'd have a, a, a sheet that we put around us. And we used to go in for what they called the Swedish massage. We did this sometimes when we were a little inebriated from drinking too much. We used to go there to sweat it off. <clears throat> so we used to go there, and we went to this, into, into the Schwitzes, used to sweat it off. We used to go into this Swedish massage, and they would hit you with leaves and stuff and things. And, and we would love it. And then we would go in to sleep the night away. And they would give us these little cots, I remember it to this day, with, with a canvas bottom. It's an unfolding cot with canvas bottoms. And they would have like a 50 or 60 of them laid out in this big room. And you would go lie down there and sleep and sometimes sleep the night away. But these cuts were used so much and so often by very heavy men that they sagged in the middle. So when you, and me, I like to sleep on the edge of a bed. So when you try to go to the edge of, I remember this. So when you try to go to the edge of the bed, you would roll back into the middle all the time. Well, anyway, I would go there with my friends. We would take a schwitz, and we would walk around nude with, with a robe on. And there were women that would give you the, sh the pound the, the leaves on you and give you the massages. And then in the morning, you would get up, and there was breakfast there. And we'd go into, and I tell you, it was a wonderful time. And here we were, two young kids going there, sweating it off, having a good time, kibitzing and, and, and laughing. And we would go in, have breakfast, and go home. And that's part of our lives. And we would have a wonderful time. And the real reason I wanted to come today was to tell you the story of Rosita. We headed off to Buenos Aires for five days. And we met the most incredible family, OK? We met Rosita. Rosita is the daughter of the eldest brother that settled in Argentina. Mark is the son, my husband, the son of the youngest brother that settled in New York. Why did we find her? Because Argentinian women are proud, and they don't change their names and take their husband's name. So she's still a Gelbaum. They had told us, oh, bring some family pictures, OK? So we brought a whole envelope of family pictures. Rosita came to the meeting with the family pictures. How did we get our family pictures? When Mark's father passed, 
was alive, he had this trunk, you know, the foot lockers you used to travel with, locked in the hall closet. Instructions not to open it. So when he was alive, nobody opened it. When he passed away, his wife, Mark's mom, refused to open it. We waited when she passed away, the three boys sat down with this trunk and broke it open. What was inside? I was expecting all this travel paraphernalia from all these amazing trips he was on. No, there was a collection of photographs. No names, no dates, no places, just these old photographs. That's what we brought to meet Rosita with. What did Rosita bring? Where did she get her photographs? When her father was alive, he had this trunk locked with instructions not to open it. And when he passed, okay, his wife, Rosita's mother, opened it. What was inside? The identical pictures. Identical.